the topic of today's class is social democracy. <clears throat> its character, its troubles, its alternative futures, uh, leading to the discussion of what should replace it. Uh, this is a topic of immense importance for anyone who is interested in progressive alternatives in the contemporary world because social democracy, <coughs> institutionally conservative social democracy, remains the default position of the progressives throughout the world. Uh, my plan uh, for today's argument is to proceed in the following steps. It's not clear that there'll be time to go through all of them, and then the discussion uh, may continue next week. So the first step is to return to the characterization of what social democracy is. Uh, the second step is to describe in broad terms what has happened to it, its transformation since the middle of the 20th century. The third step is to suggest a general view of the causes of this transformation. And the fourth step is to outline the general character of the argument about the achievements and the failures of social democracy. Both the argument that exists in the world and the argument that does not exist and that should. Uh, the fifth step is to address the most notable recent attempt to revive and renew social democracy what is sometimes called the Nordic model, and to place the discussion of that model in the context of the preceding argument about social democracy. The sixth step is to focus on what social democracy has done or can do and what it has not done and cannot do within the specific area that has been of greatest interest to it, which is the attenuation of inequality through compensatory and retrospective redistribution by tax and transfer. And I want to use this discussion in the sixth step of the argument to propose some general principles uh, that can guide us in thinking about the proper place of compensatory redistribution within a larger transformative project. The seventh step is to address the structural problems of contemporary society that lie beyond the range of social democracy, or at least of conventional social democracy, and to explore, once again, schematically, the relation of social democracy to this suppressed or yet unaddressed agenda. Uh, and that's a long discussion that serves as the bridge to the heart of this course, which is the relation of progressive alternatives to these unaddressed structural problems of the contemporary societies. Uh, if we were to deal now in detail with each of these problems, we would anticipate the entire course to these initial classes. Uh, so I want to find a way of addressing these problems only in an anticipatory and sketchy form that then leads into the subsequent arguments of the course. Uh, and the A step is to speak about what's, what's left after this ambitious discussion. Uh, on the one hand, with respect 
to the practical political basis of an alternative to social democracy, the nature of the social or class alliance that could sustain the requisite alternative. And on the other hand, the vision of the larger ideal, the prophetic message that can help drive such a transformation. So I'm going to stop at each step of the way in this eight-step program uh, and uh, invite your engagement. So first, let's return to the conception of what social democracy is. I'm understanding social democracy not as a timeless option in <coughs> the repertoire of political economic alternatives available to humanity, but as a particular historically located compromise, an institutional and ideological settlement that was established, especially in the rich North Atlantic countries, in the middle of the 20th century in the aftermath of the Second World War, presaged by initiatives before that war. It was a compromise. And uh, last week, in the first class, I suggested to you an initial view of the character of that compromise as a kind of bargain. And I said, the, on this view, on this interpretation, which is just a heuristic device, uh, the forces that challenged the established organization of power and production in those societies largely renounced that challenge. And those that retained the challenge were driven to the margins of political life. And in exchange for this renunciation, uh, the state was allowed, was allowed by all the mainstream political forces to acquire the power to regulate the established form of the market economy more intensively, to attenuate the inequalities generated in that established form of the market economy through retrospective redistribution by tax and transfer, by progressive taxation and redistributive social spending as entitlements or as transfers, and to manage the economy counter-cyclically, especially through fiscal and monetary policy. So on that third point, the state was allowed to increase its margin of maneuver in macroeconomic policy, in particular liberating itself from the shackles of the goal standard. The goal standard has been interpreted, it was interpreted by the uh, Polish economist Kalecki uh, as a way of making the level of economic activity depend on the level of business confidence. Uh, so the, the, the breaking of the gold standard uh, dramatically increased the room of maneuver of the state in macroeconomic policy and had a decisive role in shaping the the form of the so-called business cycle or political business cycle uh, from the middle of the 20th century onward. Now let me complement this view, uh, this view of the business cycle of, the, of social democracy as a historically located settlement, an institutional and ideological settlement with another take at the same subject matter. An unsentimental view of historical social democracy, not by its own lights, but as I think it really has been. 
uh, on this unsentimental view, historical social democracy has been composed mainly by three sets of institutional and legal arrangements, <coughs> each of them embodying uh, a set of compromises, in particular class compromises, compromises among collective interests in society. The first set of arrangements of historical social democracy privileged certain insiders vis-a-vis -vis outsiders. The most notable way in which that happened was with respect to labor in the labor market. <coughs> Under historical social democracy, workers who had stable jobs in the capital-intensive sectors of the economy, and most notably in industry, in what we call mass production industry, were privileged over all other workers. Workers who uh, worked unstable or precarious jobs in the less capital-intensive sectors of the economy. Uh, these workers were represented by collective organizations, unions, and their collective representation was a major part, a mainstay of the basis of the social democratic parties and movements. So it's important to understand that this defense of the core constituency came at a price, at a variable price. The price was to prefer their interests to the interests of all the outsiders, all the other workers who were less benefited or even harmed by many of the policies and arrangements of historical social democracy. Now, that's not the only form of uh, this defense of insiders and outsiders. It's just the primary form. There were certain other forms that were also part of the panoply of arrangements of historical social democracy. Uh, in the market for corporate control, the preference for uh, established owners and managers over all outsiders. Uh, a bias in favor of the stability and in particular a bias in favor of the incumbents against the challengers. And in the product markets, a reluctance to radicalize competition, which also favored the established interests against all possible challengers and favored established large firms against emerging disruptive firms. So this is the first set of arrangements that characterized on this unsentimental view, historical social democracy. It was the political economy of the insiders. And uh, especially with respect to labor and the labor market. And it acquiesced in a dualism of the labor market, uh, a division between the stable, relatively privileged workers, whom the, whom the Marxist had sometimes called the labor aristocracy, and everyone else. And especially the increasing number of workers who, uh, in the con under the contemporary transformations of economic life, have come to be called the precarious. The second set of institutional arrangements of historical social democracy uh, consisted in the orchestration by the state, the state as the broker or the orchestrator, of deals between big business and organized labor. The subject matter of these deals was primarily the distribution of 
benefits and costs of the different possible trajectories of macroeconomic policy. And these deals are then sometimes called social contracts in a laudatory language or uh, simply incomes policies in a more neutral language. Now, the parties to the deals were these big interests, organized labor, representing the minority of the insiders, uh, and big business, by opposed to the uh, emergent disruptors, or small business. Now comes the third set of arrangements that define historical social democracy. The third set of arrangements was the development and defense of a very high level of social entitlements, many with a redistributive consequence, paradoxically funded by the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption. Uh, typically through the comprehensive flat rate value added tax or through some functional equivalent to it. Uh, and we're going to explore later the significance of this apparent paradox that redistributive social investment and spending is financed by a form of taxation that on its face appears to be regressive. Now, uh, before I uh, invite your, your engagement, let me anticipate the second step of the argument, which is very brief. What has happened to social democracy, to this system that I've just described in these two terms, as a historically located settlement and as a set of three arrangements? In a nutshell, what has happened is that social democracy has given up little by little, the first step of arrangements that, the first two sets of arrangements that I described, the arrangements privileging the insiders against the outsiders, and the arrangements organizing these deals between the big collective interests. It hasn't given them up completely, but it's given them up little by little. It's eroded them. And in giving them up, it has retreated to the, the third set of arrangements as the last line of defense and the core of historical social democracy. The preservation of a high level of social entitlements or of investment in people and their capabilities, paradoxically financed by the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption. That's the first and most notable thing that has happened to social democracy, and it has been happening for a long time. Now, we're going to discuss the the, the causes of this transformation and the argument, but for the moment I'm just describing schematically. The second thing that has happened, and this will be the object then of another part of today's argument, is an attempt to, following this retreat that I've just described, to breathe new life and new meaning into the historical social democratic project. By a series of arrangements that seek to preserve its commitment to social protection and social investment while rendering the economy more, quote, flexible or liberal liberalizing or flexibilizing the economy, the labor market in particular, but every aspect of the economy more generally. And that project, this project of the flexibilization or modernization 
of social democracy has been undertaken under various labels, such as the Nordic model that we'll discuss. Now, this is a momentous set of transformations that I've, that I've described. You'll notice immediately that there are transformations that can't adequately be described, even, under the conventional ideological labels, such as capitalism and socialism. They, they have a very particular character. And to understand them, we have to fix on the institutional and legal details and on the class compromises or social compromises that are the counterparts to these institutional moves. It's momentous because, as I suggested at the outset, social democracy remains the default progressive position. The most widely admired political economic project in the world. The one that a large part of the world would like to join if it could join it without paying too great a price in the disruption of established interests and arrangements, as in the idea that I mentioned last week of the, the tropical Sweden admired in uh, uh, many of the emerging countries. So a great deal turns on this. The, the, the question that's posed is, is this the movement of history? That is, will the, the, the future of progressive alternatives in the world pass through some renovation of historical social democracy? Or is historical social democracy, as I believe, an inadequate instrument in the next historical period for the prosecution of the progressive program? So let me stop there. So that's the first step. It corresponds briefly to the first two steps of that eight-step plan that I laid out in my, in my initial remarks. Yes? Could you speak, speak more loudly? Yes. Yes. Uh huh. So in Israel, we have a big, uh, big wave of unionizing in the last seven years. And there is a newspaper which is very against it. And it talks in the same, uh, same manner about social democracy. People who are insiders against people who are outsiders. Mm -hmm. And we even uh, found a professor, his name is Luizy Gingals. Which, which tells there are three enemies of the people. The, the, the rich people, the, the state-owned uh, companies, and the unions. And they are all taking our money. So if you can please explain, when you talk about outsiders and insiders, I know that you are progressive in this discussion. No, no, but I try to specify what I, what I mean in this discussion. So the core context in the evolution of social democracy is labor. That, it's not the only context, as I, as I suggested, but it has been the most important context. And a division in the labor market between two kinds of workers. So social democracy was not the only author of that division. Uh, that division has many causes, many roots in the evolution of the economy and of politics. But social democracy was historically a co-author of that division. It ended up accepting it and in some respects deepening it. Uh, so that was the most important context. There are two kinds of workers. There are workers who are relatively privileged, who have stable uh, so-called good jobs, who work in the capital intensive sectors of the economy, and then there are all the other workers. Those other workers are the outsiders. That's what it means. It has a very concrete reference. Uh, and that's not the, as I said, that's not the only reference because 
social democracy also favored other insiders against other outsiders. Okay, the corporate example. The big businesses against the emergent disruptive businesses or against retrograde small family business. Uh, uh, in the market for corporate control and in the product market. No subversion, no planned subversion of the established forms of corporate control, and no radicalization of competition in the economy. So uh, the cumulative effect of these economic prefer preferences, commitments, was a favoring of the incumbents against the challengers. And so that was then another complementary meaning of the division between insiders and outsiders. That was the context of historical social democracy. And some part of it remains very significant today. Although, as I said, when I describe what, what has happened to social democracy, there's been a retreat. So, a retreat then followed by this attempted renewal, as in the Nordic model. So there's been a retreat. So one side of the historical process is a flexibilization, a, a, an evisceration of social democracy, this falling back to the last line of defense, but then that has been followed by an attempt to move forward again through a liberalization or flexibilization of social democracy. Uh, and thus results what already last week I described as the hegemonic project of the North Atlantic elites, which is to combine American-style economic flexibility with European-style social protection. Uh, and then there'll be something that will be more robust and more appealing. Uh, and on this very simple view, we'll somehow combine efficiency and equity. Uh, it will respect the enormous power of the market to generate wealth, the established market, but the market will continue to be humanized, and humanization was the main objective of historical social democracy. Yes? So I think I share your observation uh, uh -huh. of the three institutional compromises, but I'm wondering if those were con uh, conscious decisions by social democrats. It seems to me more that there might be a deeper root cause, something like having a strong power base defending against all the attacks that were coming from the outside and that those institutional compromises were just inadvertent results. Yes, abs absolutely. So, but this, uh, at this stage, especially in our arguments, this is an impossible question to answer, right? Because uh, it's really a question about the character of historical experience. Uh, we, we act in this twilight, right? Everyone is confused. Everyone is at the mercy of the ideas available to them. You know, this is an astonishing feature of historical experience, uh, which people underappreciate. And it's one of the reasons for, for, an, for an effort like this one the, especially politicians and activists, they don't understand the extent to which they're hostage to the ideas available to them. So uh, let's take an example uh, here of what happened in the prehistory of the social democratic compromise, the response to the Great Depression of the 1930s. Uh, the Americans elected Franklin Roosevelt as president. Roosevelt was not a revolutionary, 
but he was a radical experimentalist, a genuine experimentalist. He heard many voices. He was disposed to disrupt the, the American economy. In the, the early phase of the New Deal, the first phase, we'll, we'll discuss later, was a phase characterized by, by many attempts at institutional experimentation. Now, here's the astonishing thing. What was the leitmotif? What was the central theme of these institutional experiments? Now, if you heard Roosevelt's rhetoric, you'd think it was disruption, democratization of economic opportunity and even of assets. But it wasn't. It was restabilization of the economy. It was a corporatist orchestration of competition. Uh, it included a series of measures such as jobs provided by the state itself, work projects and work teams, but under the aegis of this restabilization. Now, if you study in detail the programs of the earliest phase of the New Deal and compare them to the economic programs that the Hitler regime in Germany adapted in its early years, you discover, to your astonishment, that they're extremely alike, down to the minute details. But these political personalities and movements were completely different. Their objectives were different. Their temperament was different. It wasn't a superficial difference. I'm not suggesting that there was some hidden affinity between them. But the detailed programs, one after the other, are like mirror images of one another. And under the aegis of the same general idea of corporatist orchestration or restabilization of the economy, rather than the radicalization of economic democracy. Why? It's hard to understand this as something that was imposed on Roosevelt at that time. He held real power uh, to go in different directions. He tried to go in different directions, but those were the dominant ideas. Those were the only ideas that in detail were available at that time on both sides of the Atlantic. And so uh, the, the, the common attitude of the political agents is to think that their only problem is the struggle of interests and winning power, the obstacles to power. And once they have power, they'll be able to do what they want to do. Because there's no problem in, in, of the ideas. They think that the ideas are infinitely elastic. That's not what happens. They come to power and then say, well, now what are we going to do? Uh, and they speak with the people around them. And the people around them have this tiny stock of ideas. And they're then in the hands of these ideas. And you don't, you, you, you don't have ideas when you want to have them. So you come to power, you need the ideas, and then you don't have them. And now that is aggravated. In the, in the conduct of the progressives by another feature which is uh, very interesting and generally unremarked, which is that they claim as an alibi for the failure to develop ideas that they're not tactically convenient to reveal in full the nature of their plans or intentions. So then they're caught in this characteristic situation of pretending to conceal, for tactical reasons, a plan that they, in fact, don't have. No one develops a plan secretly, like, like a military strategy. How will you invade the other country? That's not, that's not how you develop a political economic program. Uh, a, a, a political and economic plan can only be developed by being debated. And it, it, it can't live in the mind of an isolated individual. It can only live if it's a collective product. 
So this other feature then aggravates this phenomenon. So this is an indirect answer to your question, to what extent were they conscious? Uh, uh, they're, they're, they, they had a very limited uh, sense of the options available to them. That's the main argument that I'm making because of the limited stock of ideas. So, and the, so then there's this characteristic form of agency in history, which I suppose you could describe as semi-consciousness, shadows, uh, in a certain level of, of, of confusion. They th and typically the political agents, the way they think of themselves is they think they're very practical not interested in abstractions and ideas. And then, because of this unacknowledged dependence on the established stock of ideas, they sink into this swamp of anti-pragmatic pragmatism, which they're wearing these chains of the available ideas. That they, uh, and they then confuse that with practical constraints. Yes? Um, you said that there were no other ideas but mentioned that uh, FDR had wanted to try some other things. Were those other things just sort of other approximations of what was already out there, or were, did any of them have any character? Well, we'll talk about that later, because now just to anticipate here the <coughs> discussion of what happened in the United States in the 1930s, um, you could distinguish four stages in the evolution of the long New Deal, that is the New Deal going beyond Roosevelt's own life. So first there's the early institutional experimentalism, the first two or three years of the New Deal, in which the, the center of the experiments turned out to be these corporatist orchestrations, these restabilizations as I describe rather than the deepening of economic democracy that you might expect Roosevelt to have wanted and that he himself said he wanted. Uh, then there was a second stage in which the funnel narrowed to the provision of antidotes to economic insecurity. So the institutional experimentalism remained confined to certain sectors, such as the reorganization of the housing market. But the main theme then became the narrower theme of safeguards against economic insecurity. The signature initiative was the Social Security program. Then comes the third moment, which is a remarkable moment, completely misunderstood, which is the war economy. That was incredible, because uh, in the war economy, under the pressure of the national emergency, the Americans, who were supposed to be devoted to this sacrosanct ideology of the market, cast it all aside as if it were just a mask. And they ran the economy on completely different principles. in a freewheeling coordination between the government and the producers with a series of characteristics that are unimaginable to Americans who are living today. For example, in the war economy, the top marginal rate of the personal income tax in the United States came to exceed 90%. Americans who are living today can't even imagine that that happened in the United States and not that long ago. And the result was sensational. In four years, between 1941 and 1945, GDP in the United States doubled. The war economy was conducted on the basis of massive mobilization of national resources combined with bold institutional innovation. Both elements were necessary. And the result produced this sensational 
uh, expansion of economic growth. I'm not arguing about, not saying that there's a direct mechanical transferability of this experience to the conditions of a peacetime economy. But obviously, there were lessons to be learned that were not learned. That is, the whole experience of the war economy was, was treated as if it were an anomaly, an exception, with no pertinence to the reorganization of the peacetime economy. That's not an intellectual necessity. You, you could have conceived the project of having a war economy without a war. Uh, and then comes the fourth stage of this evolution. Uh, presaged before the war, but deepened after the war and after Roosevelt's death, which was the turn to the focus on consumption. So then the Americans come to redefine economic democracy as the massification of consumption, a market in mass consumption goods. But they experience in the closing decades of the 20th century a, a violently regressive redistribution of income. How can they reconcile this regressive redistribution with mass consumption? One of the ways in which they did it is by replacing the idea of a property-owning democracy with a kind of fake credit democracy. And the policy of easy money is the macroeconomic basis of this reconciliation. So this is a dramatic story uh, in which showing that the, the, the stock of conventional respectable ideas in politics and in the academy is very narrow. Reality, historical reality, was much more surprising. And all sorts of things actually happened which can't be understood within the confines of the ruling ideas. That was the point of telling this little story. So, this also, I think, is another sort of indirect answer to the question you had raised about confusion. Huh? Uh, so, and it, 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 it adds something to my initial answer to you. People are hostage to the established ideas, but then comes the knock of historical reality, and they, under the pressure of emergency, of necessity, of opportunity, they do all sorts of things. Uh, that they themselves don't understand. Uh, and they, they, they fail to develop the, the ideas that would reveal to themselves the significance of their historical experience. Yes? Say, say that again? Uh, which was the size of the insiders and the outsiders? Uh, well, it's hard to quantify this, of course, but, but in every economy that has ever existed, and certainly in this historical period, the The labor force working in the capital-intensive sectors of the economy was always a minority. Always a minority. It was never the majority. Uh, and in every economy that has ever existed in the world, uh, most workers work in small firms, and particularly in retrograde family business. That's where most people are. And retrograde family business, which is based largely on self-exploitation and family savings, is uh, outside. And it's associated with the small business class. Historically, social democracy it had as its tendency, and this came up last week, to regard the small business class as its enemy. And then 
So if, if, if you define mass production objectively, narrowly, uh, there have always been fewer industrial proletarians than there have been petty bourgeois. And if you define it subjectively, not as a certain level of income or wealth, but as an attitude or horizon, the disparity becomes much greater. Because the ordinary horizon of much of humanity is this aspiration to a modicum of independent prosperity. And then, so then the question arises, what is the instrument for that idea of economic independence? In the absence of other alternatives, by default, it becomes traditional family business, small-scale property, small business, and so forth. Um, so I think it's safe to say that the core constituency of historical social democracy, if we define it as uh, labor headquartered in the capital-intensive sectors of industry, capital-intensive sectors of the economy, m most notably industry, mass production industry, has always been a minority, uh, uh, a variable minority how much of a minority has depended. And of course, uh, much depends as well on the labor law regime. And the contractualist labor law regime adopted in the North Atlantic world is not the only labor law regime that has existed in modern history. But let's keep that aside because now we're, we're focusing on historical social democracy and specifically on the North Atlantic countries. So shall I go to the, yes. Yes. Social entitlements? Well, it's just that, so there the suggestion is that this project of compensatory redistribution has two sides. One side is on the revenue raising side of the budget, and the other is the spending side of the budget. So the revenue raising side of the budget is progressive taxation. And the spending side of the budget has two forms. One form are social transfers that don't take the form of rules and rights. And the other are so, are, are, is redistribution that takes the form of rights, as in unemployment insurance. And that's entitlements. So entitlements is the, the, is the rights form of redistribution on the spending side. And I simply pointed out this very important feature of, his, of historical social democracy that the redistributive entitlements were based on the regressive <coughs> taxation of consumption. I'm not criticizing that, because I, I want to get then to the argument about that. What's the meaning of that? I'm just observing. That's a fact. Yes? Just a really quick question. Um, do you see the new sort of shifts with, say, for example, the Labour Party in the UK with Corbyn, um, and sort of a bit of a move to the left uh, in comparison to third way or new labor, all these things, and sort of a return to just a more solid defense of social entitlements, or do you think they're- Of social, uh, of of social democracy. Of the, of the third stage of entitlements? Or do you see it more as a return to prior forms of these arrangements, or, or a new version of it? What, what do you make of it? Well, this is a question of a different kind, right? I mean, I th I th it's, it's hard to, to place this discussion here. Uh, you're, you're asking about whether in a particular country, in this case Britain, uh, the proposals that are being made are uh, fundamental renewals of social democracy. We haven't yet discussed enough uh, about the, limit, uh, the the limits of social democracy to make it possible to answer that question meaningfully. I'd simply anticipate my view that for the most part, no. For the most part, uh, 
uh, the people who are leading from the so-called left, the social democratic parties, are belated traditional uh, representatives of historical social democracy, of the good old days. So, like Sanders, like uh, is a belated New Dealer, and, and I don't think it's different in Britain. Uh, but it would be unfair and irresponsible to, to leave the discussion of that. We, we then have to go into the details. And I think it would be better to revisit your question after we have advanced in exploring what some of these alternatives would look like. So then we know what the line of division between social democracy and the alternatives to it might be. Yes. So um, you said the spending side of, of redistribution yes. is composed of things that are based on like rights slash transfers or entitlements. Right. So what's an example of like a transfer that's not an entitlement? What is that? Well, it could be. I mean, the 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 law could. Uh, 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 give things to people. For example, subsidies, oh. implicit subsidies that exist in, in, in many countries for uh, goods that are necessities. But they don't take the form of rights. So it's obviously a, a relative distinction. But it's simply to point out <coughs> the obvious that not all redistribution on the spending side uh, is expressed as a set of rights. Much of it is, and some of it isn't. Uh, and uh, just for analytical clarity. Yes? No. Okay. So, um, yes? I have a question. Marx, in the, in the third volume of the Capital, he talks about the Splitting the capital between the financial sector and the yes. industrial sector. And he said that the industrialists are the most progressive part of the capital. And we need to be aligned with them in order to get yeah. something done. Yeah. And you are talking about uh, if, if you want to be aligned with them, you you need to work the best the most progressive part of the of the proletariat is is the is yeah the, i the i don't think i that i don't think that division holds today uh -huh. so it's a prejudice of uh, 20th century and 19th century economics and it was a prejudice that was embraced by the classical development economics of the 20th century that industry is the most productive form of the economy. So the essential message of development economics was transfer workers from the less productive to the more productive, meaning in practice in most countries, transfer them from agriculture to industry. Now, that no longer makes sense. That, that simple association of the advanced part of the economy with particular sectors against other sectors. Because now, increasingly in the world, we have a vanguard of production that appears as a fringe within every sector of the economy, in knowledge-intensive services uh, and in precision scientific agriculture, as well as in high-tech industry. So it's, it's, it's not a distinction, this distinction between the vanguard and the rearguard, that can be adequately described as a hierarchy of sectors in the way it was in classical Marxist economics or in classical development economics. Um, now we come then to the next step of the argument. Uh, which is the, the, the simple account of the causes so characterize social democracy, and I made a claim about what in general has happened to it. So then the, uh, 
The third step of the argument is the view of the causes. And there are what seem to be two major sets of causes of this retreat or evisceration of historical social democracy. The economic causes uh, and the social cultural causes. So the economic cause of the transformation of social democracy has two faces. One face is domestic, the other face is international. It has to do with the world economy. The domestic face is the transformation of the main practice of production. There is an intimate association between historical social democracy and a particular paradigm of production. It is the paradigm that we call mass production or Fordist mass production, especially manifest in industry. Fordist mass production, Fordist by reference to Henry Ford and his assembly line, his, his automobile factories, Fordist mass production is the large scale production of standardized goods and services with relatively rigid machines and production processes on the basis of semi-skilled labor and in the context of very hierarchical and very specialized forms of the technical division of labor. That's mass production. And mass production was the base of historical social democracy. Those workers <clears throat> working in the capital intensive sectors of the economy and particularly in the factories of mass production were the very core of the historical constituency of social democracy. And now there's been a transformation, which has been immensely troubling to social democracy. So uh, mass production is no longer the vanguard. It's no longer the most advanced form of production. There is a new advanced form of production, which we will have occasion to explore in this course. And all I want to say, it's, it's, it's most tellingly labeled the knowledge economy. And it has a series of characteristics that uh, approximate production to, to, to science uh, and have at least the potential to relax or even reverse the constraint of diminishing returns which is perhaps the most universal constraint in economic life up to now. Uh, and requires, as part of its moral or social background, an elevation of the level of trust and of discretion in work. So uh, a simple military analogy would be this. Mass production is like a traditional infantry formation, command and control. The knowledge economy is more like a guerrilla operation, an irregular force requiring great flexibility and permanent innovation, but with the potential for the for the large-scale force to acquire the attributes of an irregular force. It's as if you were to say the whole army should be like a guerrilla force and not just a, 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 a small little group within it. Uh, now, this new form of production has not been disseminated to the whole economy. It has remained confined, quarantined, 
within insular vanguards from which the vast majority of the labor force remains excluded. Historical social democracy or its successors, its contemporary <coughs> representatives, do not know how to deal with that problem. Uh, so it's, it's not industry against the other sectors. It's a fringe in every sector. In every sector, it appears as a fringe within industry, within services, within agriculture. It's the vanguard fringe. And this new form of vanguardism is like an archipelago of these islands, excluding the vast majority. And in communication, in communion with one another throughout the world. Now, something remarkable has happened. Uh, in the past, the most advanced form of production is rapidly disseminated throughout the economy. So mechanized manufacturing, which became mass production, which was studied by Adam Smith at, in its inception and then by Karl Marx when it was more mature, uh, became the model for the whole reconstruction of the economy. Every sector of the economy, including agriculture, was transformed on the model of mass production. Now, this new knowledge economy should, in principle, be susceptible to even more universal dissemination because it has no intrinsic connection with any one sector, industry. But the opposite has happened. Instead of being disseminated, it's quarantined. Now, so for example, there's a debate in the United States about economic stagnation. And there are these economists who attempt to naturalize the stagnation, claiming that the contemporary technologies have inherently less potential than the technological innovations of 100 years ago. And there seems to be absolutely no ground for that. What could be more revolutionary than artificial intelligence? A fundamental cause of stagnation is that this new economy is confined. How could there not be stagnation or a slowdown of productivity if the most productive practice in the economy is denied to the vast majority of workers and firms? That's the beginning of an explanation of stagnation. And as it is an explanation of stagnation, it's also an explanation of inequality. There are these structural divisions between the advanced and backward sectors of the economy, which then become the source, the motor of these vast inequalities and exclusions. And now, instead of the dissemination of this new economy, the opposite has happened. It's not just that it's been confined. The large firms that, for example, in high-tech industry uh, represent the knowledge economy have discovered a way to routinize or commoditize parts of their business. And these parts of the business that have been commoditized or routinized, they, they factor out of their production system and subcontract to belated Fordist firms working with cheap labor in other parts of the world. So there are a million slaves in China uh, doing the work of a tiny group of people in California. Uh, so this is what, what has happened, in fact. It's the opposite of the dissemination. There's been a, a, a retreat to, to this inner sanctum, a division between the core of the knowledge economy and the routinized parts. Uh, so there can't be a progressive political economic pro project in the world now that fails to engage this reality. So this transformation of production has been associated with a change in the, the organization of labor 
on a worldwide scale. So the historical basis of social democracy, mass production, is associated with the existence of a relatively stable labor force in the capital intensive sectors, typically assembled in large productive units, such as factories, and later in offices, under the aegis of large corporations. That form of production, which prevailed in the world from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century, was preceded by several centuries in which production was organized on the basis of decentralized networks of contractual arrangements not internalized in the single firm, such as the so-called putting out system that Karl Marx describes in the initial chapters of Capital. And now, it seems, that we have in the world a kind of new putting out system on a global scale with these contractual arrangements fragmenting the, the process of production and attributing them to firms of workers in different parts of the world. With no political project or no legal regime capable of mastering this new reality. So, uh, aggravated by the arrival on the world labor market of hundreds of millions of, of Asian workers, who sell their labor cheaply, helping further to erode the historical basis of the core constituency of, of social democracy. Yes? But is that so, maybe there are mechanisms against that. So I know that Huawei, um, the Chinese mobile phone producer, is largely employee owned. So that the, there were, was technology transfer. Um, most of the technology in how to build a mobile phone wasn't developed in China mm -hmm. itself, but was transferred through legal or sometimes illegal means um, to this country, to this company, and then benefits actually partially direct the workers who work in this Hawaii company. So are there mechanisms, especially in China, <coughs> that counteract? No, I'm not, I'm not saying that they're not mechanisms. In fact, the whole premise of my, the, my project here is uh, that this new economic reality can be redirected. Mm -hmm. uh, and this economic vanguardism, this new form of economic vanguardism, can be established in a, an inclusive form rather than in the insular form that it now takes. Now, I do also believe that although there are many fragmentary initiatives in the world that might be thought to go in this direction, as you suggest, up to now they're very limited. And not only are they very limited in their practical effect, but they're not presented as instances, as down payments on some general project that has a doctrine. And we know that the way that things work in the world is that transformation requires the combination of tangible initiatives with their doctrinal representation. No, no experiment in some part of the world has transformative significance unless it can be explained and interpreted and becomes then associated with some set of ideas that can then resonate throughout the world. And that's what has always happened, happened in the past. But I'm, we're, 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 we're running ahead of the argument, as it were, because we're not at this point dealing with these, with these alternatives. So I'm just characterizing this first cause, uh, this, this combination of economic causes, both, both domestic and global, for the erosion of historical social democracy. Now, there's a second set of causes, which is social and moral. And it is particularly manifest in the European home ground of 
historical social democracy. So I'm going to describe it in caricature-like form because I, I just want to make the idea patent. Huh? Um, so social democracy uh, expresses and reinforces social <coughs> cohesion through money transfers organized by the state. So take a simplified description of a contemporary economy like Sweden. Uh, and you can imagine it in this little fable that I'm going to tell as an economy of three sectors. So one sector are the declining mass production industries. Um, actually, let's say four sectors, because the second sector is what Sweden has, the whole world has, retrograde small business, regressive in its organizational and technological form. That's, say, the second sector. Then the third sector are the vanguard disruptive firms of the knowledge economy, that employ a tiny fraction of the labor force, but produce an increasing part of the wealth. And then the fourth sector is the caring economy. That is the economy in which the state pays someone to take care of someone else. So a very large part of the jobs that have been created in Sweden over the last several decades are jobs established and paid for by the state, typically for a woman, a nurse or a social worker, to take care of the very old, the very young, the, the sick, the invalid, and so forth. So. The state then collects money from the people with money, as for example, the entrepreneurs in the new knowledge economy, and then directly or indirectly sends these checks to a, a larger number of people. Now, suppose that operation takes place against the background of a very high degree of social and cultural homogeneity. In a nation of people who look like one another and can even, at the limit, think of themselves as one big family. They're a tribe. In that context, the inherent fragility of money as a social cement is concealed because the, the practice of the money transfers is taking place against the background of this tribal homogeneity or collective identity. Uh, now suppose that the degree of homogeneity diminishes through, through migration, through social and cultural complication producing heterogeneity. then the fragility of money is exposed <coughs> as a sufficient social cement. There's a great deal of empirical study suggesting the consequences of cultural uh, and social heterogeneity for uh, the reluctance to sacrifice. So again, you, willingness to, to sacrifice for other people's children is a proxy for social solidarity. The nation ceases to be a tribe. And then uh, people discover that money is not enough as a basis of social cohesion. So just as a thought experiment, you could ask what would be enough, given that money is not enough. 
uh, it seems that there is no adequate practical basis for social solidarity that does not involve direct responsibility to take care of other people outside the boundaries of your own family. So direct engagement with others. There's no substitute for that. Money is not an adequate substitute for that. So in societies in which there is universal military conscription, for example, military service is a partial substitute or mechanism for that. But in the absence of military service, of common national sacrifice, then some form of social service. So, for example, you might imagine, again, just as a thought experiment, the principle that every able-bodied adult should have at least two positions in society. A position in the production system and a, a position in the caring economy, in helping to do things for other people in the society, either part of his life a period of social service, or part of the working year, or whatever. And money would not be a substitute for that. That's the, that's the only, on this view, the only possible basis of cohesion. Now, I say that just to sharpen the contrast with what social democracy has done. In fact, it has no such project. That's not part of the historical repertory of social democracy. And social democracy then turns out to be infirm in its response to the experience of heterogeneity, of social and cultural heter heterogeneity. And it's troubled. And that's part of the, the, the background to the rise of, this, of the so-called right-wing populist movements in Europe that have helped shake the ascendancy of, of social democracy. Uh, so this is just a description of, of, of causes, just to help explain that retreat or that evisceration of historical social democracy. Um, comment about this? Yes. So perhaps the best idea would have been to avoid uh, social change, at least uh, uh, when it happened, I don't know, four or five decades ago, it says in European countries. Let's say, Russian or you know, Sweden. Now, to avoid it, what do you mean? Uh, for example, if, if migration was one of the causes that led to the downfall yes. of social democracy, then perhaps less migration or no migration would have kept the system as it was. Uh, it, I mean, despite of all the negativity that, that yes. Applied, but Yes. Yes. So, but w what are you suggesting then? There was a mistake of the, his, of the social democrats to have acquiesced in migration? I, 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 that, that would be my suggestion, at least from, from that perspective. Uh -huh. Yes, in the narrowest terms, of course, but uh, you may not be taking into account all the consequences of practical and spiritual or psychological of this retreat into a citadel. Uh, so then the social democrats say, let this moment last forever, They're like, like Faust. Huh? And uh, uh, this perfect moment of the mid 20th century, uh, they couldn't stop there, right? So they'd have to say, let mass production not go away. It was wonderful. Uh, now we have this world of disruption, of precarious workers, of this confusion in the world. And in a sense, they do do that. So one of their residual political economic programs is to buy a few more years for mass production. And in that respect, they converge with the right-wing parties. Yes? If, if, if I may uh, say, uh, wouldn't 
perhaps the counter argument to that is saying that, well, saying that something was inevitable, that that moment couldn't be kept, given that a kind of false necessity as well. Uh, the idea that the world has to change automatically because... So there are two sides, right? So, so there's... So one side is a difficulty in dealing with transformation. History is transformation. So one interpretation of your remark is uh, a, a project is wedded to a certain set of presuppositions. Just try to perpetuate the presuppositions as much as possible. Well, that's the definition of being a conservative. You want to conserve a certain world. Huh? Uh, but then comes the other side of the argument. Not only are you trying to defeat change and to freeze the economic reality in place, but you're failing to engage the interest and value and potential of these particular transformations. The knowledge economy is infinitely superior to Fordist mass production. It has a vast potential to increase not just the prosperity, but the freedom of humanity. Uh, it's better for the economy to be like a guerrilla force than for it to be like a command and control infantry battalion. And you could say the same thing about migration. It's better for there to be complication for humanity to, to, to uh, not to be just a set of tribes. Uh, that produces a higher form of social life. It has, it, it, it has enormous risks. It creates all of this disruption. So it's not just an argument about the necessity of confronting change. It's an argument about the <coughs> superiority or the potential of these particular changes. Uh, that's, that's what the argument would turn into. Huh? But at, as, as, as a practical matter, the idea of freezing the social world, of closing the frontiers, of trying to perpetuate the existing economic regime seems to be a fantasy and a fantasy in the minds of its own defenders. That is, they don't really think that they could have this forever. All they think is that they could get a few more years out of it. And that then becomes pertinent for them because of the division between biographical time and historical time. So this is a, an important recurrent theme in our programmatic discussions. Uh, and let me just state it in a, in a, in a sharp form. Uh, we don't live in historical time. We live in biographical time with these limited lifetimes. But these projects that we're beginning to discuss about alternatives are not projects that develop in biographical time they develop in historical time. So then there's this problem that the economists call a principal agent problem. You, you, you go to the political leader or the labor leader uh, and you say you have to take this risk of leading a reshaping. Huh? Uh, and the leader says, you're asking me to risk my relation with my traditional base before I have another base. And I'll be left with nothing. So it may be that for the society or the economy, this rear guard defense of declining mass production or of tribal unity in the culture has no future. But it has no future in the long term. And I don't live in the long term because I'll be dead by then. Uh, and that's this problem of historical and biographical time. Huh? So yes. What do you think is keeping the vanguard closed? Is it a neoliberal project of like wealth accumulation? This insular vanguardism, yes. The insular vanguardism. Yes. So what's keeping the vanguard closed? And when there are sort of rich entrepreneurs who go on TV or whatever and talk about the need, because I've seen, I work in education, I see them for teaching entrepreneurship in schools. 
This seems almost like a project of opening the Vanguard. What's keeping it it closed? So this is a very complicated question. And um, let let me answer it first in particular with respect to the economic transformation uh, and then in a more general way. So I was referring to this message of development economics, the late 20th century development economics. The basic message was take people from agriculture and put them in industry. Take them from the less productive sector to the more productive sector. That will give you a short-term boost in economic growth. Now, they always paid homage, they genuflected, to the so-called fundamentals. The fundamentals were institutions and education. And there's this big deal, this lip service to education in classical development economics. The truth is that in mass production, the workers barely need to be educated. Just take that example. What what does a worker in a Fordist factory need? He needs three things. First, he needs a disposition to obey. Shut up and obey. The second is he needs elementary literacy and numeracy. He needs to be able to read and understand simple instructions. And the third thing that he needs is basic physical dexterity, especially hand-eye coordination. So when they hired workers in these Fordist factories in these countries, one of the traditional tests that they asked you know, move your hands in opposite directions. That's education. So, so it's, it's, like, it's like mass production is like a kit that you can transport from place to place with minimalist presuppositions. Now, the knowledge economy is not like that. The knowledge economy has very demanding presuppositions. Institutional, social or moral, and educational. It really does require education. So you can't do with the knowledge economy what you did with mass production, which was make it easily portable in in that way. Uh, um, So that's that's the beginning of an answer to your question of why is it insular? It's insular because there's no organic or vegetative extension of the knowledge economy unless these presuppositions are satisfied, which was not the case with mass production. But I think that your question can and should also be answered at another more general level, which is not related to the specific content. So... And this has to do with the concept of what you could call the path of least resistance. So whenever there is a change in the world, some exogenous shock, as the economists call it, some innovation, the established forms of social life have to be reshaped to accommodate to the change, to use it. So... There's a technological revolution, for example, and this potential to, to change the character and the reach of production. What normally happens is that the innovation is assimilated in the form that least disturbs the dominant interests, including the dominant class interests, and the established preconceptions. So the, the, the predisposition is to assimilate the new thing in the way that's least disruptive. That's what I'm calling the path of least resistance. So then you could say, applying this concept to the phenomenon of the knowledge economy, that the insular form of the knowledge economy is an expression of the path of least resistance. It's, it is the way of assimilating and establishing this new paradigm of production that is least disruptive 
of the established interests and preconceptions. An inclusive form of the knowledge economy would be much more disruptive. Now, that way of thinking then suggests an interpretation of the characteristic mission of thought and of progressive politics. The reason for theory in politics and for transformative or progressive action is to have an alternative to the path of least resistance. That's what it's for. So there are always going to be changes, and the changes are always going to be tend to be confined to this Procrustean bed of the path of least resistance, to be belittled, to be contained. And then the transformers, the radicals, the defenders of the alternatives are going to be the people who want an alternative to the path of least resistance. Now, they then have a very hard task because by definition, the path of least resistance is the one that can be most easily carried out. But they have an advantage, and the advantage is the following, illustrated by the example of the knowledge economy. The confined form of the innovation, the one that contains it so that it is least disruptive to the established interests and precon preconceptions, typically fails to exploit the larger potential of the innovation. So the reduction of the innovation to this set of constraints diminishes the potential. Practical example is the knowledge economy. The price of the insularity of the vanguardism is relative economic stagnation and greater economic inequality. And so that's, that's, the, that's the advantage that the would-be progressives or disruptors have on their side. That uh, an inclusive form of the knowledge economy would not simply be uh, more egalitarian. It wouldn't just be a moral or political ideal. It has on its side the advantage of the exploitation of this greater potential. Now, we don't have any adequate way of thinking about these things. This, now, let me point in another direction, back to this other great theme in the arguments here of this course, the background of ideas. So, the way in which the left over the last 150 years has thought about this theme is influenced by theories like Marxism. So there's a, there's a closed list of alternative regimes in history. Each of them is an indivisible system. You either manage one of these regimes or you replace it all at once by another system. And there are these laws of transformation governing the foreordained succession of these regimes in history. So history is the project. And we don't have to worry. We just have to be sure we're on the right side. We don't need to have a project. The succession of the regimes determines, a, determines the project. Uh, if, the, or if all of those ideas are false, there is no closed list of regimes in history. The regimes that exist are not indivisible systems. And there are no laws of transformation. There are constraints, there are explanations, but there are no higher, there's no script governing the historical script. We're in trouble. We're in intellectual trouble because we have no way of thinking about structural change. That's our situation. Uh, in which, on the one hand, we have these predominant forms of social science and policy discourse that tend to naturalize the existing social arrangements. 
And on the other hand, we have a way of thinking about structural discontinuity that we have inherited from theories like Marxism in which we can no longer believe. And we should no longer believe. They're false. Uh, they're like a fable. And one of their historical roles, especially in the imagination of the progressives, has been to arouse the heroic will. So I was speaking of the path of least resistance. We, we struggle against the path of least resistance. It seems like overwhelming odds. And then we tell ourselves a story. The story is that history has a plot. And the plot predetermines our eventual triumph. Not necessarily our triumph in biographical time, but our collective triumph in historical time. And it's as if this fable then served to arouse the heroic will to resist and to persist against the overwhelming odds. So that's how it seems that these theoretical ideas have functioned in, in, in the minds of the progressives. So we then would have to dispense with these fables. But that requires not just learning or developing another way of thinking about structural discontinuity. It also requires something which is morally difficult, which is to dispense with the idea that we have a friend who is in charge of history, uh, and uh, which is really the, the background, the, the moral, not just the methodological or epistemological background of, of, of the attitudes of the left. Yes. So, there is something that I don't, I don't understand. <coughs> if I want to, to come to, to real transformative action, yes. I need to have a buffer within society that is in the caring system that allows people to be, uh, to use the, the, the previous social democrat so you're speaking about that second cause of the transformation of social democracy, the rise of heterogeneity. Yes, because yes. It's, it's a problem. Yes, you know, in Israel, yes. In Israel, because of the military service, and because you have a big kibbutz, moshav, all kinds of, of, of uh, structures, and we could have done a, a jump and make the high-tech or the disruptive uh, economy be a larger part of our economy in regards to other places in the world. Yes. Because we had that kind of buffer in the yes. educational system. Yes. So this is this is the way to do it. What's the this? So so the, the, the buffer. You, what what buffer? buffer? You mean the buffer being the tribalism or what? No, the buffer is the way to have a, to to make the, the high tech economy more inclusive. Yes. I need something. I need something that will help me live in immigration uh, in the world. I need to have something that will help. So me. I think, but this is another argument. There's a there's a loose relation between these problems. You're you're conflating all of them. So, to my mind, and this is not this is an argument for another moment in the course. Mm -hmm. The project of developing an inclusive form of the knowledge economy is one of the great projects of contemporary progressives. And it's a project to which we can give content. It requires a series of legal and institutional changes, <coughs> democratizing access to uh, productive resources and opportunities. It requires the accumulation of social capital, which should not depend simply on tribal homogeneity. And it requires the development of a very particular kind of education. Uh, which is not the kind of education that generally prevails in the world. Uh, and so we're, we're going to discuss that project. Uh, and so similarly, a pro uh, there, another project is to develop a basis for social cohesion that is more substantial than money. It's not to say that money transfers aren't useful and even indispensable, but that they're not enough. Uh, 
Now we come to the next step of the argument, which is so these are the causes. The causes of the transformation or evisceration or retreat of social democracy. What is the basic shape of the argument about the achievements and the flaws of historical social democracy? So first let me say what I regard as the most significant achievement of historical social democracy. The most significant achievement of historical social democracy is a, a very high level of investment in people and in their capabilities, their physical integrity, uh, their education, a high level of endowments and of instruments. That is the greatest achievement of historical social democracy. Now, the centrality of that achievement is not expressed in the dominant institutional projects in the world. Let me give you an example, a European example. of the European Union. After all, Europe is the core home ground of social democracy. The European Union has developed according to the following organizing principle. Uh, the power to define the rules and arrangements of social and economic organization <coughs> is increasingly concentrated in the center of the government of the union. De jure in Brussels, de facto in Berlin. Uh, and the power to define the educational and social endowments of the individual citizens is delegated to the local authorities to the national or subnational authorities. So there's a narrowing funnel of institutional convergence at the top, and then the local governments deal with the details about providing people with the requisite instruments, social and educational. Now you might think that it should be exactly the opposite, that this organizing principle of the European Union should be turned on its head. So the, the member states at the national and subnational level should be given the greatest latitude for institutional experimentation, including experimentation in the forms of, of economic and social life. And the primary vocation of the union should be to ensure the capabilities and endowments of all of its citizens, universally, so that they can embark on this course of radical innovation and experimentalism. And that would be a way of recognizing in the government of the union what has been the central historical achievement of social democracy, but it would involve a complete revolution, uh, a, a turning upside down of, of the arrangements of the union. Now, if you put aside that claim that I'm making about the central achievement of social democracy, then what's the, the shape of the conventional debate, the conventional criticism of social democracy, which has helped motivate this transformation. The claim is that there are two main sets of arguments. Arguments of efficiency and arguments of fairness. So the first set of claims, the efficiency arguments, uh, Uh, may take the view 
that all of these arrangements that privilege insiders over outsiders, primarily in the labor market, but secondarily also in the product markets and in the market for corporate control, impose on the economy costly rigidities. And these rigidities have to be blown open. So that's the first set of arguments. And then the efficiency arguments in the traditional polemic about historical social democracy are married to the fairness arguments. Historical social democracy is a plot of the insiders against the outsiders. And it wants to wear the mantle of social justice, but it's in fact a campaign of the insiders against the outsiders. That's the, those are the two arguments and they function in that way and their force helps explain this transformation of historical social democracy that I've just described. Now, that's the existing form of the argument. Now, what is the argument that doesn't exist? Uh, the argument that doesn't exist is the argument that social democracy is inadequate or misguided, both with respect to the goal and with respect to the method or the practice. So the goal in the most generic form has been the humanization of society. So the market shouldn't be a savage market. It should be humanized. It should be given a social character. So the goal is too small. Uh, the historical project of the liberals, of the socialists, of the progressives, of the left is not simply to humanize society. It's to divinize humanity. It's to, it's to raise us up. It's to raise ordinary men and women up to a, a higher form of life, of capability, with a greater scope, with a greater intensity. The essential idea of the progressives on this other view is a shared bigness. We'll become big together. And, and, the, and the, 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 the campaign against inequality is subsidiary to this larger objective, which is objective of greatness. Greatness is the central idea in politics. And inequality by itself, or equality, other than as subsidiary to this ideal of greatness, only arises when we give up this larger hope and we settle for a smaller hope. Uh, then there's the argument about the method or the practice. So here, the claim against historical social democracy is that not only is its goal too small, this goal simply of humanizing rather than of empowering, of en enhancing the agency of the ordinary man and woman, make, making him bigger. Uh, with a chance of living a larger life. The method is incapable of producing, over time, real alternatives to the path of least resistance, because the method forswears persistent structural innovation. And that's, as it were, built into the original historical compromise of social democracy. The original historical compromise, the very nature of that institutional and ideological settlement was a retreat from the attempt to reshape institutionally the worlds of power and production uh, in return for the power to regulate, to redistribute, and to manage countercyclically. But everything in social life turns on structural change. 
So the, the, the supreme object of transformative ambition is always the regime of society. And it's, it's remaking, and for the sake of its remaking, it's reimagination. And change can be structural while being fragmentary, or piecemeal, but nevertheless cumulative. So that's a, that's, a compl that's a different kind of debate about social democracy, and the one that motivates me here in these interventions. It's different from that fairness and efficiency debate. That's the apparent debate, as opposed to this suppressed debate, which would lead us in the direction of the, of the search for alternatives. Now, you will have noticed that of my eight-point plan, which I laid out, I've only gotten to the fourth step. Uh, so, uh, but that's all right, because uh, this, this subject of uh, social democracy as the default position is absolutely central. And then we'll devote the next class to the last four steps of the eight-point plan. And this discussion of social democracy anticipates each of the elements of the alternatives that I hope to discuss and explore with you in the course. Continue next week. So I should say, I should just mention, there's been a problem with the course videos. Let me explain. Uh, the problem with the course videos is there, there's a university-wide problem in the Canvas course websites, which they're trying to fix. But in the meantime, the course videos are on my own website. So you can go to my own website and have access to the videos. <laughs>